All right, I'm going to rattle off some names of trusses and you buzz in if you've heard of them, okay? Ready? Hal Pratt, Warren, Town Lattice, K, Fink, Double Fink, Gamble, King Post, Queen Post, Hammerbeam, Baltimore, Pennsylvania, Lenticular, Scissor, Parker, and Virendil? I'm Paul Kasabian, I'm a structure engineer. I did a video about truss behavior, and in this video I'm going to go through some of the list I just gave you and how and why they're different to each other. First up, the Howe Truss by William Howe, a classic truss type that was used regularly for bridges in the 1830s and 1840s. The only disadvantage of this is that the compressive elements are the longer ones, which means they're more likely to buckle, and that limited the length of span that this could be used for. Next, this truss type designed by Thomas Pratt. He took the Howe truss and instead put in cross members, X-bracing all of them in tension throughout the whole bridge. Oddly enough, this is not called a Pratt truss. This is a Pratt truss. Do you see how what we call a Pratt truss solves the disadvantage of the Howe truss by shifting the geometry so that the compression elements are shorter? The actual inventor of what we call the Pratt truss was Squire Whipple. He also was able to do work where he was shifting from what used to be rules of thumb related to truss design to actually applying analysis to trusses. Why this is not called the Whipple truss, I have no idea. The Warren truss, otherwise known as the kind of truss you draw if you're thinking of drawing a truss, because everything is just zigzag as you go along, right? And that's actually the advantage of fabricating these. All the members, the diagonal members, are the same length. All the connections are essentially the same. It isn't as structurally efficient as what we call a Pratt truss is, but it has its own benefits of repeatability of fabrication and construction. If you take a Warren truss and put a whole bunch more diagonals all next to each other, you create what's called a town lattice truss. You may see a lot of these when, if you go see uh, covered bridges in the state of Vermont. And if you actually continue this thinking and you keep adding more and more material as diagonals throughout, then what you have is essentially a beam. Because at the end of the day, that's what a beam is. It's a set of filled in trusses. The K truss. This takes a Pratt truss and improves yet again by adding further bracing to those shorter vertical compression elements. This means you can span further for the same material or use less material for a similar span. The disadvantage of the K truss is that, as you can see, there's just more pieces to fabricate, more connections to make. But depending on what's important to you and the cost of material and the cost of labor and assembly, then this is a good advantage um, to use if needed. The Fink truss. These are often used in gable roofs for homes. They align with the sloped roof that's usually used for helping shed water and or snow, and it allows for structural depth. There's also a range of other options that relate to the Fink truss, the double Fink, the fan, and there's a lot of variety that carpenters have used that are called Fink trusses in some way. The King Post truss. This is the most common for a short span. It is very simple, and if it's just a King Post, the center element, and nothing else, then all that center element does is really just hold up the weight of the lower tensile cord. If, however, you use this, say, in a roof of a building and you also add diagonals to it, then those new diagonals take compression and they put that king post vertical member into tension. The queen post. Here we take essentially a king post but have two verticals either side of the center and connect them with a the horizontal. The advantage of a queen post truss, especially as a roof structure of a home, is that you've now provided for, say, additional storage space up within the roof area. The disadvantage is we no longer have any diagonals in the center, so structurally this is less efficient because some of the members and the connections go into bending. So little less efficiency structurally, big gain in terms of utility. The scissor truss. Watch out for these. You see these in a lot of cathedrals and churches. They sort of allow for a bigger elevated sense of space. They look really lovely. The thing is they're often misunderstood. Remember, all types of trusses that have diagonals, the bottom members in tension 
and the upper members are in compression, and other diagonals in the center, if you compare it to, say, the king post structure I showed you earlier, are also in compression. So, in a scissor truss, that means at that center crossover point, which we call the crux, at that center crossover point, the forces are going in different directions. The lower members are pulling down and the upper members are pushing down. So it's tension in the lower ones, compression in the shorter diagonal uppers. And that's counterintuitive only because they now line up, right? And in the case of a scissor truss, it's incredibly important to have that center vertical, let's call it the king post, because that's intention and it's helping to stabilize the whole form of this type of truss. The hammer beam truss. Yeah, not a truss, right? I mean, they look great. There's a lot of um, changes and differences that you can make through the structural areas. You can put a lot of decoration on these. They allow for big open central area but they're not a truss. And the only thing therefore to remember, given that they still behave structurally, is that means they are going to be pushing outward on the walls either side that are supporting them. So where these exist in older stone wall structures, those stone walls are usually extremely thick. If you ever see a hammer beam truss with a lower tensor tension element, usually an iron or steel rod, that's often been added in to help repair some issues where people saw some movement in thinner walls and needed to stabilize that truss. And lastly, the Virendil truss. I think by now you probably realized it's not a truss, right? It's a series of frames. And by being a series of frames, that means every member, every connection is carrying bending. That's very inefficient from a structural material usage point of view, but it's very useful if, for example, you need a spanning structural element in a building, and in the building all the people need to walk around without bumping into diagonals, then a Virendil truss is a very good solution to that. You also see it in a set of pedestrian bridges, usually made out of uh, steel tubes, simply because it's easier to weld together 90 degree connections and just use slightly bigger tubes than you otherwise would. It's a series of frames. We happen to call it a Virendil truss, so just be aware of that distinction between what something is and what we happen to call it. I'd like to bring up at this point, it reminds me of that famous uh, line in Romeo and Juliet by Shakespeare. Juliet's uh, fallen in love with Romeo, he's a Montague, Romeo Montague, she's a Capulet, and their families don't get along, and she famously says, what's in a name? That which we call a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. Right? So she's drawing that very important distinction between what something is called, or what we've happened to call something, and what it is. Pretty important life lesson there, and all to do with trusses. Okay, thanks a lot. If you enjoyed this video, do remember to like and subscribe. See ya.